take a deep breath even before I begin and I offer you greetings and good day to all of you who are gathered with us today and many thanks to our dear Robin for gathering us. I once heard a prayer in my childhood that began with these words that you are the God of our hearts and we praise you for sending those who love us enough to gather us up into community. And I bring that gratitude and that spirit to what we are sharing with each other today. What a gift for our collective imaginations that we have shared poetry and beautiful poetry it has been. It has not been standard for all presidential inaugurations uh, to include poetry. And in American history, uh, many have not included poetry. But for those who did, I believe that they were giving a nod to the power of how the arts inspire our collective imaginations. And depending upon the poems shared, how they can compel us to see truth, to see each other, and to believe that another world is possible even right now. When he was campaigning for the presidency, uh, Donald Trump would often share a poem that was particularly meaningful for his vision and for his leadership. It was not a poem as these that we have shared today. Words that call us together under one sky, words that remind us that there is something better down the road for all of us. His poem was written by Oscar Brown and turned into a song in the 60s by Al Wilson. It was called The Snake. And I won't repeat the words here because the less we recall of those words, the better off our entire universe is. But I will characterize them as words that were intended for its hearers to embrace their worst fears about themselves and about each other and about the world. The words cast each other, the words cast the other, whoever the other is as a dangerous power coming to beguile, to trick, to deceive and to steal what is rightfully yours. And Lady Liberty uh, notwithstanding, many in this country have viewed the immigrant, the refugee, the one seeking sanctuary, the poor, the non-white, the LGBTQIA, and all who were not of the American brand of Christianity to be snakes to be feared, coming to steal what rightfully did not belong to them. Mr. Trump did not create the hatred that has been on high definition display for all of the world to see. But his fears met the fears of millions who have dined sufficiently on untruths and falsehoods about the American experiment. As Mr. Trump was inciting crowds to violence on the campaign trail back in 2016, Black feminist writer Adrienne Marie Brown shared a prophetic word with those of us who were listening. And I have been intentional uh, in these last four years in particular to listen to the words of Black women. She said that we were living through the unveiling. She said, things are not getting worse. They're getting uncovered. She said, we must hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil. Our sickness in America is not 
trump deep. Our sickness is rather the consequence of the story that we have eaten since our beginning about who is worthy, who is, who deserves liberty, who deserves freedom, who has the right to breathe. And we've lied to ourselves for so long about our story of origins that our lie has become enshrined as the only truth we have space for. We, Republican and Democrat, tell that lie, not just through the election cycle, but in our everyday investments, in our intent to have dominion over the whole world. But I'm hopeful and not you know, in the, uh, not just in those who are being inaugurated um, today. I'm grateful for uh, President Biden and for Vice President uh, Harris because they began yesterday on a note of lamentation and sorrow and grief just for what we have lost in this past year and beginning in that place gives me strangely a lot of hope. My hope is grounded in the reality that our struggle is a spiritual matter. It's a matter of conscience. It's a matter of the beauty of all humanity and all of God's creation and that kings and kingdoms rise and pass away, but somehow and for some reason, God keeps breathing life and hope and joy and the hunger for the kind of connection that we are creating with each other today, a connection that's not limited by race and creed and nationality and gender and orientation, and certainly not thwarted by our inability to gather together in a physical space, but in our, our hunger for truth, our hunger to be healthy, our hunger, hunger to be whole, and that we see each other in that hope. My hope is grounded in the truth of what I know is possible when we recognize that we breathe together and that everyone's breath matters to God. So one of my favorite stories of Jesus is with his encounter with a man who had been laying by a pool whose waters the people believed had healing powers. Uh, and as the lore around this story goes, the only way to get the healing this water offered was to beat everybody else, beat all of the others who were in line. The only way to get healed was to be the first one in. And they believed that this angel would come every so often to trouble the waters. And if you were first, you could be healed of your ailments. The man has been laying in this, near this pool in this place called Bethesda, a place um, noted for mercy and grace, but he's been laying there for 38 years, always overlooked and never able to get what he need, which was the story he was telling himself. But when Jesus comes by, he asks him a direct question. He says, do you want to be healed? And the man answers a question that Jesus did not ask, <laughs> as we so often do. He begins to recount all of the reasons why he has been prevented from getting what he needed. And in my imagination, I'm sure that he is recounting all of the people who have been standing in his way, preventing him from getting what he needed. But I believe when Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? 
He was rejecting the notion that healing is so scarce that it has to be rationed by angels. He was rejecting the notion of the poetry of fear. He was declaring that it is possible for all of us to have our needs met. He was rejecting the poetry of scarcity. And he was saying to this man, get up, pick up your bed and walk. You have what you need because our God has breathed it into you. President Biden said yesterday, to heal, we will have to remember. To heal, we will have to remember. And my prayer is that we will remember that we were sick long before Donald Trump rode down the escalator to announce his candidacy. My prayer is that we will remember that the American project was born with a birth defect. It was born in white supremacy. It was born in a lie, a fear dependent upon the genocide of indigenous people and the blood and the labor of human beings stolen from Africa. And we will never get the healing we need until we tell ourselves the truth and until we work together to create a way forward, one that is grounded in repentance and humility and in the understanding that every person in this world and all of God's creation has the right to breathe. Truth cuts, but it heals. And the ability to imagine us at peace with ourselves and at peace with the world really does uh, seem a call too wild to make, especially from exhausted and traumatized spirits. But another world is possible right now. I believe that. And I believe it for all of us. I believe another world is possible. Freedom from fear, freedom from weapons, freedom from hate, freedom from want. And while I certainly believe that we will get up from laying beside that pool and we will do the work necessary to hold this new administration accountable, but our hope is not built, our hope is not grounded in princes or in horses but in the one whose breath we all share. So let us be the people who work for healing and the kind of healing that is only possible when the light of day has shined on the truth. And when we've given each other space to confront the truth and let us be the people who will hold each other tight as the truth is being revealed, that we will hold each other tight across all boundaries, never forsaking one, never leaving one, understanding that all are precious. And let the truth of Bethesda, the place of mercy and grace abound. And I end with these words, from Jan Richardson. It's a blessing and it's called When We Breathe Together. She says, when we breathe together, this is the blessing we cannot speak by ourselves. This is the blessing we cannot summon by our own devices, cannot shape to our own purposes, cannot bend to our own will. This is the blessing that comes when we, we leave behind our aloneness, when we gather together, when we turn toward one another. This is the blessing that blazes among us when we speak the words strange to our ears, when we finally listen 
into the chaos when we breathe together at last. May God bless you and may God bless us all.